leadership, it's that saying of like, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make them drink. I'm not leading the horse. I'm leading the horses first. So the problem that I'm answering is the first. So what I'm actually doing is showing them how to get to the water and how to drink. Welcome to Exploring Mind and Body with Drew Tadia. Drew is an expert in nutrition, fitness, lifestyle, and more. And he wants to help you live a healthier, longer, and more active life. Now here's your host, Drew Tadia. Welcome to another edition of Nationally Syndicated Exploring Mind and Body. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for tuning in, for being a part of our True Form Life community. We're coming at you with a brand new show. We appreciate whether you're listening on terrestrial radio across the country or as a podcast around the world. We certainly wouldn't be here without you. So stick around. We got all that coming up. This is Exploring Mind and Body. Naturally improve your lifestyle one show at a time with your host, Drew Tadia. Okay, welcome to another edition of Nationally Syndicated Exploring Mind and Body. We're super excited to have Lisa here with us. Welcome to the show, Lisa. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to get to chat with you today. Yes, it's our pleasure. Today we have lots to talk about, but I always love to give our guests a chance to resonate with our audience a bit. Tell us about who you are, what you do, how you got into it. Oh, fabulous. Okay, so my name is Lisa Peronzo. I'm the CEO and founder of A Healthful Life which is an online training platform designed to give people the opportunity to work with a coach to bring them back into health and fitness or to level up where their health and fitness game is at. I have over 10 years of experience in the fitness industry and multiple certifications in that. I also have, you know, the fancy education on the side as well. Um, and I decided a couple of years ago to take all of that and turn it into this online platform pretty much so that I could help more people than what I was being able to reach in the brick and mortar that I train out of. Awesome. So how did you get into this? I got into this actually, uh, really stepping back when I was 19, I had enlisted in the military and I got really severely hurt on a training exercise. I shattered, fractured, and dislocated my right foot. I didn't walk for the better part of about a year. And going from literally like 60 to zero and having to discover what I could do when it came to fitness for my quality of life and my longevity was a a complete shift from where I had been before. And what it really taught me was the power of embracing your own strength and meeting your body where it's at and showing your body that honor and respect that it deserves to move from that space instead of like forcing it into a box. So I I took that knowledge and, you know, after a lot of years of kind of trial and error, to be quite honest, I came up with a healthful life, which is really meeting people where they're at instead of where I think they should be at or where they think they should be at and helping them embrace their strength and their power from there. Okay, so tell me why you wanted to get into the military. What ignited that? I I mean, quite frankly, because I'm not the type to like BS anybody. I wanted to go to college for free. (laughs) Nothing wrong with that. (laughs) It's expensive. (laughs) It's super expensive. And I have a master's degree too. And I knew I was going to go past my bachelor's degree. And I was like, okay, I want to have somebody else pay for this. So I had been talking with the recruiters. I had every intention of enlisting and getting the GI Bill and going to school later. And then I took this aptitude test. It's called the ASVAB. And I scored so well on it that the recruiters were like, well, we don't really want you to enlist. We want you to go to college first. And then on graduation, you commission as an officer in the military. And you basically like owe them the four years that they paid for you to go to college. So it's like a reversal of the process. So so you, you're you going through this process and then just randomly through a training exercise, you shattered your foot? Yes, uh, we were out on a training exercise at Camp Pendleton and I was doing this exercise called fast roping. When they are coming out of the helicopter on ropes, that's fast roping. So it's a quick way to insert people into tight areas essentially. Technically, my execution was perfect, and when my feet hit the ground, I landed on a rock, and my foot literally imploded. How long did it take to recover from something like that? 
uh, almost a full year. So I, my initial injury was in January of 2004. I have had multiple surgeries. Um, I've been through a ton of physical therapy and by the end of 2004, I was able to walk without any kind of assistance, but I didn't walk. Like I was completely bedridden or wheelchair bound for a solid like six months. Wow. So do you completely recover from something like that? Do you still have pain or do you still have a limp or anything like that? I don't have a limp. I credit that to an extremely good surgeon and fantastic physical therapists. Um, I do still have occasional pain. It's not as bad as what it was when I first got hurt. Uh, the impact of the injury killed all the nerves on like the arch of my right foot, the inside arch, like the medial arch. Um, so sometimes I will have nerve pain there, but is much less than what it was before. I mean, the pain would bring me to my knees and like make me throw up in the beginning. <laughs> Crazy. Yeah, not fun. But you know, it taught me as a young person that I was not invincible. <laughs> because you know, every like, 18 to 25 year old are like, I'm never going to die. And I was like, no, wait, <laughs> but hold on. I want to try. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It must be a humbling experience. Oh yeah. Um, okay. Well, let's move forward to fitness. So after that period, you knew that you did, was it because of the injury that you're like, well, I'm not going to do this military thing. I need to do something else like fitness. No, I wanted to keep going with the military that army and I kind of came to this agreement of they were, I really give them a lot of credit because they were very patient with me. They paid for all my stuff. They completely took care of me. They still take care of that injury. So anything related to that, they'll take care of um, medical wise, but they were like, let's just see how this goes. We don't want to discharge you or anything like that. Let's just see how this goes. But at the end, the full end of that first year, my doctor who's amazing was like running and high impact jumping is not going to be a thing for you anymore. Like you have to think about your quality of life. So by that point I was almost 21 and it was like big questions I hadn't thought of. Like, what do you want your quality of life to be when you're 40? What do you want it to be when you're 60? Do you want to be looking at knee and hip replacements because of a limp that throws off your gait? You know, do you want to be able to have children and bear the weight of being pregnant not on bed rest. So I started looking at those bigger things and what I could do health wise to take care of me. And that's what pushed me into fitness in an even bigger level. So I started with CrossFit, got a CrossFit certification and I have moved on from that to bar and Pilates. Now I'm working through kettlebell certifications and stuff. And all of it has been in relation to that. I'm not trying to be like the bikini model, which works for some people, but not for me. I want to know that my quality of life and my health will be sustainable for my whole life. So is that what you teach? Is yes. Your philosophy? Yes. So when someone comes to see you, what's one of the first conversations you have? The first conversation that I have with them is usually where are you at now with your fitness? And then where do you want to go with your fitness? And then we take it from there. So how many times do you get a blank stare? <laughs> you know what? Actually, not <laughs> often. People usually have a really solid grasp on what it is that they want and what their goals are and where they get tangled up in the weeds, so to speak, is they don't know how to get from where they are to where they want to be. They're focused more on where they want to be, which is fantastic. But the prospect of getting there is very daunting and it's very overwhelming and they don't have, I don't want to say like skills or tools, but skills or tools to get to that. And I have the experience and the education to give them the tools to get to that. It's shocking to me because I started out as a personal trainer and I got to tell you like 99.9 .9 out of a hundred people I'd sit across from and I'd say, what do you want? And they'd look at me blank and then they'd <laughs> say to lose weight. <laughs> I'm like, no, you don't. <laughs> you know, there's always underlying reasons and, mm -hmm. and purposes, but that's awesome though. Like, I, I don't know, I don't know where, where the difference comes from, but I think that's great that I think I really like how you phrase that from where do you want to go instead of, cause maybe, maybe I didn't phrase it right when I was starting out. Like, what are your goals? And people like, people hate talking about goals, at least from my mm -hmm. perspective. Like if we put up a social media post, if we put up a goals video, crickets. Yes. But if you phrase it differently, like, where do you want to go? Maybe we take out that horrible 
five letter word (laughs) (laughs) you're like how do i spell (laughs) i like that though because it's like the connotation of the word goal right like that can be so intimidating to people but it you're working out for a reason you're taking care of yourself for a reason what is that reason what do you want that reason to be so what do you want to have shift in your reasoning and then it's a matter of making that shift happen so share with us a little bit i know it's different for every individual but how do you get someone and you know what i was thinking like that's a really good analogy it's that bridge because you Mm -hmm. start you're starting from one place you know where you are in most cases and then where you want to get to regardless of what that is it's the bridge and you can compare that to finances and saving money you can compare that to having like a proper relationship like regardless of what it is how do you help your clients and customers connect or how do you build that bridge maybe from one end to the other i build that bridge really by talking to them about where their life is now you know and that's part of the reason too why the cookie cutter approach for me never really worked you know it wasn't just my personal experience but it was listening to people and hearing where their life and where their experience and all of that is at and then it's a matter of just breaking it down into step by step things so not every program looks the same which has been a huge blessing because it means that i get to work with this extremely diverse population which is cool for me and not every goal looks the same which is also cool challenges my creativity (laughs) (laughs) tell me some of the common for our listeners some of the common challenges that you deal with and how you help get over weight loss is definitely one of them um and weight loss for me is such a more complex issue than like watching numbers drop on the scale so i am not the biggest proponent of the like starve yourself diet or the cutting out all the things that you enjoy diet i'm also not a fan of the word diet because it has the word die in it and doesn't seem right to me (laughs) (laughs) I'm <laughs> like, why though? Uh, weight loss is huge. So I usually look, I will make people look at what that is that they're eating and then dive down deeper to figure out what their relationship with food is like. A lot of the times what I find is that people are not eating enough to support their physical level of fitness. And then their body will go into this caloric deficit mode that thinks that it's starving themselves. And then that does weird things to your metabolism. And then you gain weight and then you're frustrated because you're like, I'm doing all the things, why am I gaining weight? So that's a big thing is uh, kind of like retraining that brain muscle of like not starving yourself. How can I live a life in moderation? So I'm not that a-hole at a restaurant who's like, can I have the cob salad, but I don't want chicken. I can't have bacon. Can the dressing be on the side? No, to me, I just want the lettuce. I don't want you to be that person. And then another thing that I run into a lot because everyone I work with is a very busy adult. Even with COVID and everything we've had going on, our, maybe even more so with COVID, our adulting is like next level. And I don't know if you found this true, but like we're busy. So then it is establishing a consistent workout schedule. So the way that I have them do that is I make them pick up their calendar with me. I make them plan out their week of workouts. And I make them be, I say make, and that's very strong, I encourage them to be realistic about their schedule. If they know, I know I'm going to have a 12 hour workday this day and I'm not a morning workout person, then I'm not going to have you wake up at five in the morning to go work out because you're going to press snooze 27 times and then you're going to feel super defeated. But if you can tell me, all right, I can work out Monday, Wednesday, Friday consistently, but I only have an hour, but I also know it's going to take me 20 minutes to get ready then I'm not gonna plug you into an hour and a half long workout. That's also not realistic. I want people to feel successful and empowered by what they're doing by taking those incremental steps because taking those incremental steps means building that stronger foundation that will give you the healthy lifestyle that you're wanting. And is it difficult because it seems like I can't even begin to count how many times people would say, I'm an an all or nothing type of person. And then I'm like, how far has that gotten you? (laughs) <laughs> so how do you get people to take these uh, we, you call them incremental steps we call them small sustainable steps that last Same. i think that there's a lot of power in the weekly coaching calls that i offer to people because it is that weekly check-in of somebody being able to hold you accountable and i get that all or nothing mindset for sure i run into that a lot as well but usually my answer is the same as what you had so how far has that gotten you so okay you can sustain that for a month but on day 31 it's gone. So how far has that gotten you? Coaching calls for sure help. 
I think having somebody who can hold you accountable and be encouraging and also give you those steps and tools so that you know how to make those changes. You know, it was like you were saying, you're a personal trainer. That's your background, similar background. We know how to do that for ourselves, but the majority of the population doesn't have our background. So they're not going to know how to plug those steps in to make that work for them. And then what they get into is this all or nothing mindset. Oh, I have to go balls to the wall for a month, but then they do a month and then they give up. And then six months later, all the weights come back on. They're not working out anymore. And they're back at square one. When in reality, if they can be more objective and have someone guide them through that process of what that would look like for their lives, they can have that sustainable lifestyle. Do you think that motivation plays a big role? Definitely. <laughs> Was that too fast of an answer? <laughs> <laughs> no. For sure. Yeah. I've been so, so blessed to have worked with, I mean, everything from adolescents who are on the semi-pro, pro-athlete track, stay-at-home moms, work-at-home moms, people, I mean, who have been in wheelchairs, people who have had joint replacement surgeries, come back from having babies, heart attacks, cancer, everything. The one commonality through every single person I've worked with is the motivation factor. If they want it, it will happen. So what can you do? Like, what are the things that you do? I'm just trying to think of some of the things that I don't do personal training anymore, but I'm trying to think of like in the past, what have you been able to do? Cause it seems like, and I, I actually asked on my social media page not too long ago, maybe a couple of weeks ago, what's one thing that's holding you back from your health and fitness goals. And it, it, I got tons of comments and most were either directly motivation or motivation was hidden in there in some regard. Like I don't have the motivation to do it. Usually what I find with the motivation is it's very closely tied to being too focused on the end goal. What I want people to feel is successful, right? So if you're at point A and where you want to get to is like point L or whatever, but you don't know all the steps in between, sometimes what will happen is the motivation will die because that end goal is so daunting. And I get that. I really do. It can be extremely overwhelming. What I try to do is encourage and support every single week. Like, okay, this didn't work for you. Let's tweak this. Let's change this. Try it for the next week. Okay, you felt successful with that. Let's roll with that. Let's build on that and go from there. So then they're having these little victories and that's increasing their motivation because they know they can do it. They know they can be successful with it because they've proven it to themselves. And then that motivation ends up becoming this intrinsic aspect of their life and not something that they're like, well, I'm just not motivated to do it. Well, why are you not motivated to do it? Because that end goal is too big. So explain the small steps. So is that a weekly thing you're celebrating daily? Tell me. It depends on the person. So coaching with me, they have access to me every day if they choose to have it. Once a week, for sure, that's non-negotiable. It can be something as little as... I had a client who was working out one to two days a week. She wanted to up that to three to four days a week. Realistically, that's what worked with her life, her schedule, her family. Okay, well then let's start on the low end one day a week. Let's up that to two days a week. Let's get you to hold that for a couple of weeks. Let's take the two days. Let's turn it into three days. Let's have you hold that for a couple of weeks. Let's take your three days. Let's take it to four days and have you maintain that for a couple of weeks. And by the end of coaching with me, she was consistent at four days a week. She knew she could handle it. It was realistic for her life. It didn't impede on any other aspect of her life. And she felt successful with it. But when she was at one day, one to two days a week, the prospect of increasing was like, I can't do this. I just can't. I'm not even going to try. I, I won't be successful. How often do you work out? Well, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I hate answering that. I'll answer it for you, but I'm going to put the disclaimer at the beginning because I want your audience to keep something in mind. I get paid to do this. I need to be a subject matter expert in what I'm doing. I get paid to do this. I plan all of my classes and then I provide them to the people that I train. So I'm going to work out more than the average person, just like I would expect anybody in their own field would dedicate more time to that because that is what they're an expert in. So I work out on average six days a week. And so you think that's not reasonable for the average person? No, I don't think that that's not reasonable, but I do think that me saying that can get people in the mindset of like, oh, I have to be there too. 
Whereas I'm like, no, I, I, this is what I get paid to do. I should be working out because I get paid to work out. Like if you're in finance and you work at a bank, I expect you to be an expert in that and dedicate the majority of time to that. If you do finance and you work at a bank and you want to work out six days a week, all right, let's figure it out. I can get you there. That's not a problem. It's just a matter of getting into the weeds and figuring out the how of it. Mm -hmm. Leading by example. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that meant so much, you know, like it'd be really difficult. You know, it's tough for me. Like, I'm like, of course, I, I host a holistic show and I've been living a holistic lifestyle for quite some time, but it's pretty difficult to, to like, like if you had a, I always look at doctors. I, I, I really, I like doctors. Like I don't have a problem with doctors, but if you have a doctor sitting there that's overweight, that's smoking a cigarette, giving you health advice, I mean, mm -hmm. we got a problem. <laughs> yeah, I agree with you. But I mean, even when you think of like leadership, it's that that saying of like, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make them drink. Like the way that I think of that is I'm not leading the horse. I'm leading the horse's thirst. So the problem that I'm answering is the thirst. So what I'm actually doing is showing them how to get to the water and how to drink. And then it's up to them to take that further. Mm -hmm. But agreed with you on the doctor. If my doctor smoked, I'd be like, really though? <laughs> Come on. Let me put you on my program. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about this. But that was the same thing. I When I first got to LA, I'll just tell you real quick. When I first got to LA, I was I was working I was working out in different areas, and I was tra had a quite a heavy training schedule. But I was in gyms in in LA. There's so much fitness. It's like everyone's got to have beach bodies, and mm -hmm. they they need trainers. Like everyone's a personal trainer. No one knows how hard it is, or you know the challenges that go along with it. And they like every gym needed personal trainers. And you would I would see people that were like not very fit not very they didn't look like they're very active they would they i saw i picture this like it was yesterday and this was a number of years ago they, they were sitting there on the bench like very unhealthily looking reading from a program telling someone what to do and they weren't even watching the person they were just reading and i was like what is that i was like what's going on what's going on <laughs> but leading by example i can't agree with that more nothing drives my trainer heart more crazy than when I go and take somebody's class and the trainer. And I think it's from like maybe a braggy place of like, I look like this and I don't work out. And I'm like, <laughs> hold on. And they're like, I haven't worked out in two months. And I'm like, <laughs> why? like, but why? But, and part of the reason too, why I work out as much as I do. And in quite honesty is I'll put myself through a workout that I'm programming for a class that's coming up or a session that's coming up or whatever. And the reason why I put myself through it is not just to get like the programming aspect of things, but it's also to get my body into how does this feel? So that when I'm training somebody else, I can cue to those things. Mm -hmm. So it's appropriate for them. Oh, okay, I'm doing this exercise and I notice that my back, my abs, my whatever are doing this. If it's happening to me, it could very well be happening to them. And that's another way to build that motivation and success, right? Because if you're going through this litany of exercises and at the end you feel like shit, you're not going to want to do it again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I love that though. Like we did, I did a, we do on, more online stuff now, but I did a seven day, seven minute Tibetan Tabata challenge. It's a tough word. Tabata. And it was just seven minutes, but I tried to pick, I programmed it all myself. I tried to pick the most challenging exercise I could find because you have seven minutes. And um, I was exhausted. Uh, yeah. And um, then, but then when I could tell people about certain things, like if you can't do jump lunges, for example, or split squats, then you can do them stationary. And then at like the 22nd mark, I was like, your legs should be burning because mine are. <laughs> But yes, exactly. Uh, okay, first of all, if you're not dead after like an eight to 10 round Tabata, you're not doing it right. Because <laughs> die. I've taught a class this morning and it was all imams for like almost an hour. I'm a little dead right now. <laughs> 
right? Yeah. I mean, you can get straight up effective effectiveness out of stuff like that. But like you said, now you know, okay, if you can't do your split squats like that, if you can't do the jump lunges, if you can't do jump squats, these are options that work for you. But doesn't that help people feel more successful too? Because there's nothing more intimidating than getting into a class and the instructor's like, and do burpees and everybody's dropping chest to the ground and you're like, but I have a jacked up knee, I can't jump. But that's my experience. But yeah, and that's, that's, I don't, that's, I don't want to like, I want to say that's like profound or like it's extraordinary. Like you don't see like a lot of, a lot of trainers would stand there and read from a program and be like, this is what the program says, do it. And you're like, well, yeah. How does that set your clients up for success? Knowing that when they're going to come to your class, they're going to feel like a failure because they can't do one of your exercises. Exactly. It's a tough place but to be in. And my reputation as a trainer out of a brick and mortar, we've turned everything virtual now. We're completely online with classes now. Um, but m my reputation as an instructor is that I'm really hard. I know that. But the caveat to that is that I'm also super motivating and I'll get you to do stuff you never thought you could do because of that aspect. Because I'm not trying to force you into a box. I'm saying, okay, look, at, if we're doing this and it doesn't work for you, then take one of these other options and you'll build into the bigger thing. If it's appropriate for your body. You know, I'm not gonna tell somebody who's had surgery for scoliosis on their back and they have a steel rod down, you know, however many vertebrae to be rolling through their spine. That's not appropriate. All right, Lisa, we do have to start wrapping things up here. Is there anything that we missed that you wanted to cover? No, I've had a great time talking with you though. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. So can you help us direct our audience to your products, your services, floor is open. Let us know what you have, what you do. Yes. Okay. So two easiest ways to reach me. First is my website, which is a healthful life.org. The second easiest way, if you're like, Oh, well, I know you're an expert, so you're going to have this in show notes and stuff. But second easiest way is my Instagram. And my handle is my name at Lisa Peronzo and both link back to one another. So the website has application for coaching. Yes, it is an application. But it is a free consultation for that. So keep that in mind. It has recipes, my blog, links to the workouts, all the things. And the Instagram links back to the website. And it has, you know, the application for coaching and all that on there as well. Email, all that, you know, all the fancy ways to get in contact with me. And what I will say on that note is because I'm so grateful for everybody who takes the time to have me as a guest on their podcasts or radio shows, TV, and all of that. Anyone who comes to me who says, man, I heard you and Drew talk and like, it was super cool. And I want to talk to you. I give them a discount on coaching. Awesome. Thank you very much. Well, thank you for having me. It's our pleasure. All right, Lisa, that was fun. That was great. I, I could oh, yeah. talk to you for hours. I'm sure. <laughs> Um, thanks so much for coming on. We wish you all the best with challenging times and kids and workouts. So keep, <laughs> Thank you. keep moving forward. You as well. Thank you for having me. My pleasure. All right, that's going to wrap things up for this edition of Exploring Mind and Body. Once again, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for tuning in and being a part of our True Form Life community. You can always find us on facebook.com slash trueformlife. We post up there a couple times a day on our story. We're always trying to bring you more content around living a healthy lifestyle, whether that be nutrition, fitness, lifestyle, and more. We also have free challenges that we do at least once a month. So if you follow us along there, you'll be able to join maybe a plank challenge or a squat challenge to bat a challenge whatever it may be we'd love to have you join us we're also on instagram.com slash drew tadia again we're posting up there a couple times a day along with our story all dedicated to keeping you fit and healthy and on track our main website is trueformlife.com if you want to check out some of our products some of our services or if you just want some great content from videos to blog posts and recipes and more we got all that at trueformlife.com. Once again, thank you so much for being here. That's it. That's all I got. I'm out of here. As always, I'm your host, Drew Tadia, in health and fitness for a better world. Thanks for listening. 
You've been listening to Exploring Mind and Body with True Form Life's Drew Tadia, fitness expert. To find out more about the show, Drew Tadia, or to listen to past shows, visit exploringmindandbody.com.